How's your mental health? I just work so much, I don't have time to think about it. That's always been my strat. If you like, think about what happens after you die, you just see darkness forever, or you start thinking of all these other stuff, and it's like, I'll just keep working. An issue with being human is that we all come with a pre-packaged expiration date. Look down at your arm, your torso, or the inside of your cerebrum and you might see it. The exact date and time of your passing away, as yet not determined by the actions you took leading up to it. This moment, this end, or as George Carlin would say, this terminal episode, negative patient care outcome, therapeutic misadventure, or finally now, to avoid euphemisms, this death will be the culmination of a bunch of stuff. Everything that happens now will probably lead up to it. Everything that happens after might result from it. One side, another side. Lightness, darkness. Giggle a positive riz in seldom. Infinite sets of polar opposites. Lots of us see life through the lens of this so-called inevitable end. This apparently terrifying conclusion to an existence already scary enough in itself. Work hard, play hard. Stop being lazy, embrace the new. Unlimited phrases come with an implicit while you still can tacked onto the end. Things are finite. Everything concludes. You hear this stuff a lot. We were born in a world that tells us to be afraid of the inherent unknown. We grew up in a cultural cross-section giving us stories to explain things we're not really sure about. Whichever religions, mangas, philosophies, canceled sitcoms told us ways death can be be cool, simple, complex, or casual. For many, it wasn't enough. Online, we commiserate in our deepest, darkest fears like their bizarre sexual fantasies, twistedly obsessing over departing forever. Is there heaven? Hell? Which will take me? Is there infinite blankness? A thousand or infinite points of light? We're paralyzed by fear, trapped by a knowledge that should be second nature, a thought that should be as semi-indifferent as noting the color of the sky. I said those last couple things because I think there's a problem with the way people think and talk about death. Not everyone, not always, but I think we're not often being honest with ourselves or one another about what death is and what it means. Why do you think all these people keep having midlife crisis equivalents? I recently read the book White Noise by Don DeLillo, spoilers incoming, which I think well illustrates our morbid fascination with drowning in death as a topic. Think of this video as like a how-to guide for dealing with the worst death fears, using the arguments made in the book as a backdrop. It'll be necessary to learn most of the plot to understand some of these arguments, so I hope you'll find it as interesting as I did, despite the time relics. First, to ease you guys in, I'll tackle what happens after death, which won't require the book. Some people think their afterlife will be a fiery place for evil people or a sunshiny place for good people. Some think there will be a certain sockless cartoon character or a certain person with a sorta unfortunate name. Potentially all stuck in a time loop around some blurry and inescapable Los Angeles mansion. Whatever you believe, you may think something bad or something good will happen to you after you die. Plug your ears till this time if you're already truly happy with what you believe or don't believe will happen after death. If you're unhappy with the thought of death because you're scared what might come after, here's a cool argument. Picture the worst possible torture imaginable. Now imagine the best possible opposite. Without information about that so-called other side, both are virtually equally likely. We can keep doing this. Picture something kind of cool, then kind of terrible. Both are equally likely without any otherworldly insight. On and on, we can imagine endless possibilities after death, each including pain or pleasure, and each with an imagined opposite just as oppositely pleasurable or painful as the non-opposite painful or pleasurable thing. For any painful thing, we can imagine an equally pleasurable thing and vice versa. We can even imagine that all things between the pain and pleasure possibilities are held equal except for the pain and pleasure themselves. Now apply this logic to all your terrible worries about what happens after death. There's no one inherent reason to think any is more likely than its equally pleasurable opposite. Of course, you may feel a religious duty to stray toward expecting pain or something, but in the absence of the skew, you have nothing tangible to expect. The probabilities are functionally equal on either side. Now what do you do? Whether due to this argument or not, a lot of people like to cling instead to the idea of losing consciousness forever. This is the big one, the one that keeps people failing to lose consciousness temporarily. It's difficult to imagine. A mental light going off. Eternal anesthesia. Nothing to feel, see, or do. Here I bring in white noise. People with a fear of losing and consciousness forever have this weird tendency to obsess over losing themselves in activities, or at least to tell themselves they're succeeding in losing themselves in activities. In White Noise, our main character, Jack Gladney, lives in a world of TV jingles, outlet malls, and parking lots. He works as a professor of evil man studies at the College on the Hill in a nondescript town that feels Midwestern or maybe like upstate New York, though the location's real-life basis is unclear. He's obsessed with death, with the possibility of dying and what comes after, but it mainly seems like the end of his consciousness is what he fears most. In the middle of the book, it turns Turns out he's been exposed to a toxic chemical called niodine derivative, which is said to likely reduce his lifespan significantly. All while random correct and incorrect facts are spit out by the TV and his children and stepchildren from five different marriages to four different women, he can't help but let his mind wander to this new unknown death time, this new knowledge of a likely premature demise. The book features random strings of dialogue from TV or radio that form a white noise backdrop, a never-ending stream of ideas that Jack treats almost uniformly as annoying distractions. Now knowing that his time on Earth is more limited, 
Jack muses about the absurdity of death rendered in facts and figures, saying that rendering death graphically as a predicted lifespan results in an eerie separation between your condition and yourself. Death becomes just another part of the same white noise routine, causing him almost to distract himself from the fear of death by trying to understand death itself, whether his own or other people's. His morbid curiosity becomes an ironic reflection of both fear and interest, since people around him seem to create a new kind of death each time they advance technology enough to analyze it in a new way. By indulging in this obsessive fear, he pretends to distract himself from the thought of death by endlessly analyzing the possibility of death as casually as he would watch TV or teach a class. Despite knowing that thinking about death in this clinical way creates a spiraling, apathy-filled feedback loop of despair over both the original fear and the sterilized analysis surrounding it. Like Jack, a lot of us fear the thought of our consciousness ending, and fail to confront this fear while distracting ourselves with work, or shows, or interactions, or whatever. After failing to confront this fear, these so-called distractions slowly start to represent the fear of death itself over time by reminding us that we feel the fear of death when we're not distracted. If we're forced to confront this fear too early by learning our rough lifespan prematurely, we may shut down, spiraling into a world of inescapable and apparently justified worry that analyzes death from all possible angles, spurred on by the noise that only reminds us of the problem by virtue of not involving that problem. Something is clearly wrong here. As you can probably imagine, the tension here comes from our not having confronted the fear of death. By leaving this stress unresolved, there's no solace from definite expiration dates, no escape from the reminder that we haven't resolved this uncomfortable fear of an ending consciousness. It feels kind of circular, but becomes clearer when we think about how most people view life. We're fed facts about average lifespans, milestones, events we hope to see and get anxious when we think we might not get to experience them all. Life becomes a checklist that needs ticks in each box, rather than an uncertain, undefined thing with a start and an end that could happen at any time. If we could just untether our understanding of life from this culturally defined not-to-scale model, we could maybe stop fearing the loss of time we in fact never had to begin with. Similarly, we're so used to the noise and movement and facts and emotions of life that we can't fathom the silence and or lack of ego that consciousness ending death represents. We love filling time and space with things and ideas, normalizing the thought that things and ideas will be here forever when there's no reason to expect this to be the case. If we could just talk normally about ourselves and our lives knowing life is impermanent, we wouldn't need to worry about and question how impermanent it actually is. Death should be confronted first from both angles, before we form expectations about life and its events and its end. We have to internalize that death is inevitable from the very beginning, near the moment we gain sentience, and learn that this finitude means we should cherish the random things we find in between. What if the true extra-worldly default is nothing and no consciousness, the easy medium, like sleep? Why can't we accept that an end to consciousness if there's no painful or pleasure consequence would probably just at worst be like dreaming for a bit. This monumental shift in life perspective, this change in how we view death, should happen individually, ideally right now, in a couple days, as soon as possible for anyone who lives in this paralyzing fear, and should happen despite others' death spirals that a person may come into contact with. Jack soon encounters the interpersonal version of this drowning and existential dread when he discovers his current wife, Babette, has been cheating on him with a man who's been giving her access to Dilar, a new and revolutionary drug that is meant to alleviate the fear of death. She explains that though her life with Jack up to this point has been full of overall happy moments, she hasn't ever escaped this fear, and it's caused her to betray his trust in the hopes that she might someday break free of this fear forever. This causes Jack to admit to his own fear of death, and to describe how Babette has made a terrible mistake in telling him her secret, since she had been his life force. The deep and simple pleasures they once shared, he says, are now lost to him. This interaction illustrates the common issue with sharing a non-confronted fear of death with someone who has the same non-confronted fear. The existential terror Jack and Babette each feel becomes the only natural conversation topic, the shared insecurity of having no expectation or comfort or confidence in what happens after the end. The terrible mistake Jack describes then illustrates the arbitrary value he ascribes to life force, where the mere knowledge that Babette's nonchalance toward death was a facade is enough to ruin any simple pleasure they had once enjoyed together, for him turning it all into more white noise. He had been trying to avoid this white noise at all costs, but managed to ruin the last bastion of hope he once had by indulging and sharing his death obsession. At this point, the only significant emotional change in either person stems from the knowledge that the other fears death too. Jack and Babette are doomed to reduce all things to white noise unless they individually confront the fear they both hold. Since neither has found a way to escape this fear of death, they gain no new insight in sharing it with each other, and instead simply burden each other with the knowledge that the so-called life force exuded by both was a facade. Beyond the irony that Jack barely notices her unfaithfulness at first, the further irony here is that opening up about a deep-seated worry would normally be a way to strengthen one's connection to a person. But the unique thing about the fear of death is that it appears to be confirmed, reinforced, and made worse if shared with others who hold the same unconfronted fear, even if shared with a close loved one. The book tells us here that a chronic fear of death is not innate, but is taught and reinforced. We may be taught by endless empty radio jingles, or by trauma, or by a certain Cartoon Network show, but 
however we learn to blankly embrace a fear of death and fall into white noise, we fail to see that our fear of death is often one-sided, easily accelerated, and readily confirmed by others with the same unconfronted fears we have. And bringing this back to our world today, while I can't know exactly what Don DeLillo intended, I interpret this scene as a warning to anyone lost in existential dread. The background noise and number of things we're expected to care about have increased since it was written, like the brain rot, TikTok challenge, informational interview, podcast, art piece, chess streams, gushing with sound that you may believe disingenuously ignore a silence or blank humming underlying it all. A silence or blank humming I think is only scary if we frame it that way. I think death is such a powerful and gripping concept that we want to find others who we think get it right, who ignore religious or spiritual stories and focus on the silence or blankness, treating it like an equalizing, terrifying, unnatural event. The communities we form on Reddit or Twitter or wherever solidify the fear of death into a lifestyle, a way of thinking, a tension that can't be resolved. Some people from these communities might think that treating death like a neutralizing hum or silence is a commitment to truth, and that doing so avoids believing in religious or spiritual stories whether told recently or for generations before us, but I don't agree. Instead, I think that by giving death this humming ubiquitous power, people invent yet another new spiritual story that death is terrifying silence, white noise that washes over us, unpleasant buzzing and harsh like neon lighting and inevitable and apocalyptic. In talking about death like it's the boogeyman, the thing that no one wants to mention, we give it power over life. We give it the contrast with color and beauty it burns to achieve in any conversation. We invent a mythology that tells us death is omnipresent and should rule how we live. There's no inherent positive reason, truth-based or otherwise, to believe any of this. Of course, there will always be people who externalize the sinking dread of dying, who think they're admitting something no one else has the courage to say, who think they know that the secret to life is that it ends. The trick here is one, to help these people by making arguments like the ones I've made in this video where possible, but two, to not get over-involved. It's not your burden to confront someone else's fear of death only your own. The only entities spreading the fear of death are people saying to others that they have it, that it's uncontrollable, scary, and something you have to ignore because the truth of how you feel is too huge. Turn around and confront the truth. Look the fact of death in the eyes. Turn back around and smile or something. Before this video ends, I wanted to bring up a couple more interesting lines from the book. At one point, Jack says, Let us both live forever, in sickness and health, feeble-minded, doddering, toothless, liver-spotted, dim-sighted, hallucinating, implying that the end of sentience he imagines appears worse to him than torture, than pain, than anything he could experience in life. Death Death here is characterized as the same silence or low hum I described before, the same uniform white noise. If you've ever heard the why are we here just to suffer thing, you'll notice that this flips it all on its head by saying that pain isn't that bad, but a lack of everything is. It's clear that Jack has mythologized death to the point that it appears almost arbitrarily worse than any suffering he could experience. Later, Jack is internally debating whether the only way out of his fear is to change someone else's destiny by accelerating their demise. His professor friend asks him if he believes that life without death is truly incomplete, to which he responds, how could it be incomplete? Death is what makes life incomplete. Death is portrayed, still, as the lens through which life must be viewed, as the reason things feel incomplete. This, painted as the truth, implies we are doomed to search for completeness while never achieving it, with death looming as the indicator that life is, in truth, eternally incomplete. We find the same tension in this fiery point that we found in Jack's resignation following his niadine derivative poisoning diagnosis. If life is inherently incomplete, Jack wonders if the only answer lies in messing with death, in taking the life of another. There's a perversion in this idea of death that likely taps into what lots of people feel when they're afraid of it, but which twists the concept of life into something unrecognizable. Of course, given that it ends, life can in some ways feel incomplete. But what do we want? To live until we're bored of living? To outgrow our relatives? Just as there's incompleteness in all that we don't get to do, there's completeness in all that we get to do. Life is both incomplete and complete. Neither conclusion has more mythological strength. To conclude, many of us fear death and believe that spreading our fear is revealing a truth that everyone feels, perversely saying the thing that you think everyone else wants to say but doesn't have the guts to. People who think this are wrong and that no, not everyone feels this way. But they're right that anyone who does will likely dive into the same resigned detachment from life if prompted, and that insecurity around death and the potential white noise, hum, or silence that follows can cause everything from brief alarm to entire midlife crises. Individually, if we have this deep-seated, unmoving fear, we should generally try our best to grapple with it before facing the world, even if we think it's immeasurable how right we are. Too many people build ideologies and entire lifestyles on shaky foundation that can be shattered online with one comment about how death is inevitable and potentially silent. The main issue with the fear of death is that it often represents a failure to confront this inevitable, unavoidable, natural reality we find ourselves in. Since we are beings made of earthly, infallible flesh and bones and metal plates and pacemakers, a lot of people might say this means we should panic and worry at our predicament. But I say that we should learn to be more comfortable in our own skin, so to speak. Most of us naturally live life and eventually realize our own mortality, with our subsequent reaction and worldview determining whether we stay happy and how we interact with others. Given this, I think we should realize our own natural mortality as early as possible, and rather than stress about it, incorporate it into our growing, ever-changing, context-filled definition of life.